Jesus, you're always present to us. Help us to be always present to you. Jesus, you're always faithful to us. Help us to be always faithful to you. Jesus, you're always loving to us. Help us to be always loving to you. The Lord be with you. God, our Heavenly Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Trinity One God, we praise and worship you. We ask you now to bless your people, their families, their friends, all those that carry in your hearts in prayer. We ask the Lord to bless also our enemies. Touch their hearts, transform their lives, and bring them to yourself. We ask you also, Lord, to bless all men and women of goodwill, those who are seeking and searching the truth, that through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the guidance and intercession of Our Lady, they will find that fullness of truth in, our, in Jesus Christ. We also ask you to bless the church and bless the world at this time. As we ask you to bless the church, we ask you to bless our Holy Father, Pope Francis. Guide, protect him. Full, fulfill your plan in his life for the church and for the world at this time. And grant that he will be always a, an inspiration and a witness to Jesus Christ in his way of living, in his way of teaching, and in the way of, of his praying. We ask you also, Lord, to bless Pope Emeritus Benedict. We thank you for all he's done for us as Holy Father. We thank you now for his witness, his witness to us as an intercessor, a prayer, a man of prayer, and interceding for the church and the world today. That means everybody, all of us. He's praying for all of us every day. So, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful example, this great holy man, this man of prayer. So we ask you, Lord, also now to bless and guide all the people throughout the world that who are seeking the truth, that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of Our Lady, they will find that fullness of truth in the person of Jesus Christ. We ask you now, Lord, to bless them all, surround them in the precious blood of Jesus, consecrate them in the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and seal all in your most precious blood. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, upon your families and friends, and remain with you always. Amen. Now, the first thing I want to say to you is, we've put all your families, your friends, at home and abroad, all those who are listening through the internet, and apparently there's 80,000 of them. They might not all be still there, but they'll still get the blessing. So we're going to put the whole lot of them in. They were in the Mass today. That Mass was for no other intention. My intention was for all of you, and for all of you who are picking it up on the internet and on the, any other way that God will bless your families. All your intentions are in that. So you can go home with an honest heart and say to everybody, I prayed for you at the Divine Mercy Conference and you were in the masses, okay? That's very important because we all have needs in our homes and in our families at this stage. Tonight in Rome, the Salises of Don Bosco are having an assembly, the beginning of a general chapter. We have two people at it, our provincial and Father Michael Casey, Father Michael Casey, a lovely young man, and then we have Father Jack Finnegan. They're starting at this time, actually. So I just said to ask your prayers, because our well, Superior General finishes this year after 12 years, and we'll be electing a new Superior General during the next two months. They'll be at the chapter for two months. So they normally don't do the election at about a month or six weeks, so they have a chance to talk to you, to pray about it, and all that kind of thing. So uh, it's interesting that we should be thinking about these things tonight. Because I was thinking myself that I would talk to you first and foremost two things. One, something that happened, me, happened to me down in Limerick and St. Paul's in Limerick and Dura Dial. And the other then was about Don Bosco's dream or vision. So we might start off with the one since the Salesians are in prayer tonight and they're starting their general chapter. They were up in Turin, the whole lot of them, a couple of hundred of them, buses, uh, to start off their pilgrimage at Don Bosco's tomb. And they've gone back down to Rome now yesterday and they're uh, starting the chapter tonight. So the su Superior General, he's no longer Superior General now, he, he's, he's the same, he's a member of the chapter all right, but uh, he's no longer the Superior General and the new man is elected. 
So I've prayed that God will, because it's, it's, they're very worrying times, as we all know, and it's very important that we get the right person that will do and handle these situations well. So uh, Don Bosco's um, dream or vision was a dream of two pillars. And the two pillars, uh, you know, there's a big pillar and a small pillar. And the big pillar had the Eucharist on top of it. And then the small pillar had Our Lady, lovely statue of Our Lady and the other, Mary Hepper Christians. And uh, then we had the ship, which was the church. And the ship uh, was being attacked on every side. Little ships, big ships, small ships, all kinds of ships attacking the church. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> sure does. So uh, anyway, a few years ago, I went to Turin to see this picture, you see, and I was very keen to see it. And when I went to see it, I directed the place, are you expecting something to happen? I am, I said. Well, we're expecting nothing to happen. Well, of course, if you're expecting nothing, you'll get nothing. <laughs> I didn't say that to him, of course. <laughs> But anyway, the picture is there, and you can see it, and it really is a fantastic image of where we're at at the moment. Because, you know, if you see how they take a shot at the papacy and the Vatican and Rome from the United Nations, and one minute is the United Nations, the next minute is, is the Europe and Brussels and that. So what I would say, then I'll be saying more to you tomorrow during the homily. I'm doing the homily tomorrow, and one of the readings is about unity. So I would ask you to be builders of unity. And to be a builder of unity is not easy to do. So I'd say to you, do your very best, because we need to be together as things get a little more difficult in the next coming years. It may not be that long, but we need to have each other. And we need to help one another, because uh, it looks like the legislation that's coming from Brussels, and that's going on in America, I'm in touch with friends of mine in America, it would look like that everybody are going down the same, they're all dancing the same tune. And of course, the big, the big enemy is the what? The, the big enemy was the church, the Catholic Church. So they'll keep on hammering us and keep on hammering us until the Lord comes to the rescue. But he is coming to the rescue. So it's part of his plan. And, you know, his plan will be fulfilled because he has paid the price. And the price is life, life, suffering, death, and resurrection. So it's all paid for already. So you call on Jesus, and he will hear you, and he will answer your prayers because he's watching everything. And you know that little phrase in the Scripture, it says, not a hair of your head is lost that he doesn't know about it. He must have been very busy with me, you know. <laughs> so, you know, in, in reality, what he's saying to us there is, I love you. I love you very much. You're my children. You're my people in the world today. You are the church. You're very special to me. And you know what the theme of this week is? Father, thy will be done. So, the Father is watching you very, very carefully, and he's listening to everything that's going on in your heart. That's why it's so important. Now, I'm a little bit of a kind of a hyperactive fella. Some of you who know me well knows that's the truth. And recently, I said to a young man in the confession, a young priest in the confession, I said to him, you know, sometimes, Father, I struggle to get in all my prayers, I said. But I did discern it with some people, and they said, well, you can't do much about it now. But please, God, as things go move forward, you should find a little more time for prayer. And then I said, I'd try and do a holy hour every day. Oh, that redeemed me. I, was, I, was, I wasn't too bad then. <laughs> but that's the key, actually. The key is doing the holy hour. The key is doing our time in prayer. Because all the other things are secondary. Um, I remember a story. You see, Don Bosco's motto was, Da mihi animus chitara which means, give me souls, take away the rest. Now, there's another translation, the rest secondary. But the general one we use was, take away the rest. So we are working in Papua New Guinea. And uh, it's, it's a very basic country there. Not very many luxuries. And uh, so we built a fine school, put up fine big gates to protect the place. And one night, anyway, these fellas came with their truck. 
and their soldering irons and their blow torches and uh, all sorts of things. So our people went out and challenged them and they said, well, look, look, it's written up here. You know, you give me souls, you can take away the rest. <laughs> We're just taking away the rest. We're not taking away the souls at all. <laughs> so you want to be careful, know your culture, know your culture. So anyway, the thing is that um, in reality, uh, we, we have each other, we're precious to each other, and we're more precious in God's sight because God loves you. He loves you as you are with all your pains and aches. Somebody said to me tonight, what's wrong with you? So you, you have a bit of a limp. I, I didn't get much time to talk to the good woman. I, what I was going to say to her was I have two wobbly knees. But, you know, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter, as long as you get on with the day's work, you know? Because lots of people, Lord have mercy, my mother, I remember she used to say to me, Michael, your big long steps, slow down, I can't keep up with you. Now I'm saying to other people, slow down there a little bit, I can't keep up with you. <laughs> what goes around, comes around. So be careful. Uh, as, as our people say in our own circles, we'd say, be nice, you know, on the way up, so that they'll be nice to you on the way down. So. Very important. I finished my first year, uh, sorry, my six years now in Crumlin as leader of the community, and it was a wonderful six years. And uh, I think I'll have a little more freedom to do a little more, maybe. We'll see. We'll see what happens. So, um, again, you know, focus. You see, sometimes we say, I, even I find myself slipping into it sometimes. You know, when I'll be a good holy priest now, God will love me more. How can he love me more when he already loves me with an infinite love? He loves me as I am. And he accepts me with all my warts and all, everything. But he's not asking me to stay there. He wants me to come along, come closer. And you know what happens when you come closer to God? All the old rubbish and mess that's there has to be cleaned out. And normally it's burnt away by purification. We don't like that, generally speaking. Of course, when we become very spiritual, we'll embrace it. And that's what the journey we're on. So again, just to say to you that uh, God loves you. He, you have no idea how much he loves you. And, uh, you know, if ever, you know, you really go down or get anxious of that, you can pick up a little bit of scriptures. Because the scriptures are different than anything else. The scriptures actually have a life in itself. There's a life inside the Word of God. So when you speak the Word of God, then, you know, you, you're receiving the life of God. And just to open our lives, open our hearts, open our, our whole being to the outpouring of God's graces. You see, often the blockage is in us. And sometimes the blockage is a lack of trust and a lack of, a lack of confidence. So we need to realize God is calling us to a total trust and total confidence. Total trust is that when you get out of the boat and walk on the water, that poor old Peter, do you remember Peter? And a, there was a bit of a breeze, and a little drop of water splashed up in his face. And uh, he got such a fright, he looked down, and by God, he started to sink. In other words, when you take out the eye off the Lord, you begin to sink. What did he do? Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. So the same thing, same thing applies to us. When we start sinking, turn around to the Lord and say, save me, Lord. So again, I encourage you to pray and be open and also to realize that God is close. He's closer than anybody else because he's within you and he's among us. And he loves us and he loves to see us. That's why I'm saying it's so important to work for unity. He loves to see his children be happy, in harmony, and working together. So anything that's going to create division, put a big question mark on it because that's not going to help us in the days ahead. So we'll be builders of peace, be builders of, of unity, be builders of a life that is living in harmony with each other and with God. And listen, listen to our pastors and listen to the Holy Father. He's showing us how to do it. He's telling the religious, get out there, get out there and see the people, help the people. Sometimes it's misunderstood because he says, you know, I'm trying to change the faithful, not the faith. So you want to be very clear about that. Now, you can see yourself that if you try to change your attitudes or your outlook, uh, it's not very easy. It's, one, it's a very, very 
hard undertaking. So, you know, I'm sure he realizes that. I'm sure God and his blessed mother, because he's very close to Our Lady, I'm sure that they're guiding him and they may enlighten him to be patient, because he's very patient. And, uh, you know, he's, he, he says to the, to, to the priests, you know, get out there, the pastor says, and be with the sheep, be with the people, and have the smell of the sheep from you. You know, in other words, you know and you understand your people. And, you know, we're not just talking about spiritual things. We're talking about economic pressures. We're talking about all kinds of things. And facilities that we took for granted before, we're struggling to keep them there at the moment, all that kind of thing. And that brings its own pressures on older people, on people who haven't got a few bob in their pocket, etc. you know? So it's very important that we realize, you know, that the Pope is showing us the way. And it isn't as if he came and did that, you know, now, because he's Pope. He'd been doing that for 50 or 60 years. And of course, some people wore it and they took it and did well and grew, grew in holiness. And others said, ah, we don't like that, carry on. We don't want that, that's, that's, that's not us. But in actual fact, he's showing us the right way. And the right way is to opt for the poor, opt for the needy, opt for the homeless, opt for those on the margins of society. That's what he's saying to us. So don't be afraid to reach out. But look, we'll all reach out differently, okay? So, like, you don't have to do what the Pope exactly does, but you must do your little bit, because we're all part of the jigsaw puzzle, and we must put our little bit in. Now, I want to move on to a little experience I had down in um, Dura Dáil, in St. Paul's in Dura Dáil. Uh, we were doing a day of prayer, a group of us, and it was a lovely day, and all went very well, and we had the mass over, and we prayed with people, and it was wonderful. We were all quite tired. So I looked into the little crying room, and there was about six or eight people. I hope there's none of them here tonight. But anyway, they, they know I'm not saying, saying it in, in any bad way. But it just shows you, you know, how people do listen to what you're saying. So um, <clears throat> I went into them, and I said, you have no mercy, I said. That poor priest has been in there hearing confessions all the afternoon. And I said, he must be exhausted. And this elderly man stood up and said, well, now, Father, he says, you gave a talk today, and it would have been about a two or three minute slot, you know, about confession. And, said, and you told us that the confession was a spiritual tsunami. <laughs> and I want my spiritual tsunami. <laughs> what could I do? So I, I, I said to him, I'll tell you now, I, said, I know that priest who's in there, I said, and he won't leave this place and he's heard your confession said that you're all finished. He sat down, quite happy, with a big smile on his face. <laughs> Corrected. <laughs> so we need to take correction from each other as well. But it was just showed, I mean, that was just a little drop of a hint there about the importance of confession. And by God, they all took it seriously. So, you know, um, some of the people, um, uh, our singer, Bobby, Bobby. Robbie, R Robbie. Uh, he, he um, no, Colin, Colin Ray, spoke about uh, the importance of confession. And you know, he touched on parts of confession, which sometimes we as priests don't talk about it. But so, Father, I go way out, the same thing happens to me again, and I'm back here next week or the next week after. But you're, look, watch, it's like this. We'll say, there's when you're born, and there's when you die. Remember, every time you go to confession, every time, you're nearer to the end goal, okay? So it's about keeping yourself ready, number one. It's also building the life of God within us. Remember, confession is a sacrament. Look, you're not the only ones. Some people love their confession. I'm getting to that stage. But it takes a time, you know, because we all have our human feelings and we have our, you know, pride and God, I thought I was doing great, but God, here I am down on the ground again, you know? I remember once a friend of mine I don't think she's here, but some people might hop home and talk about, but a, a woman in the Legion of Mary, a great friend of mine, many, many years ago, she gave a talk, and she said, you know, I went out in the work, and uh, I failed. And she said, I had to go back and start all over again. And then she says, you know, I started, I had to go back to daily mass, I had to go back to my daily prayers. I've been, and in actual fact, the failures were the motivation to bring them back into full journey of spirituality, full journey of the life of Christ. So what I'm going to say to you tonight is this, that remember this, 
You know, we talk about healing, but, and healing is important, and you get it in the sacrament of confession, and you get it where else? The sacrament of the sick. I'm a great believer in the sacrament of the sick. For God's sake, don't wait for people to die. If they're sick, it's for the sick. It's not for the dying. Of course, we give it to the dying as well. But in actual fact, it's for those who are sick. So you're entitled to the sacrament of the sick once a month. You know, so if you're seriously ill, and this condition changes, by the way, you can do it more often. And then it's up to the priest after that. You know, once a week, no problem. And sometimes you might even do it more frequently if it's a turn in the condition, if it's a worsening of the condition. So try to get these things into your head because they're important. And if you know about them, then you'll use them. So today in the hospitals, in actual fact, they don't call the priests as quickly as before. And it's up to the family and the friends to get a friend of theirs, a priest, or to go and find a chaplain in the hospital if you can. And some of the chaplains say are not priests. So therefore, if they're not priests, they can't give the sacrament of the sick. So it's very important that you have somebody up your sleeve. And one other thing I'm going to say to you is, and it's something I feel has been neglected in recent years, so I have my own little campaign going on. There's a, praise, a, a prayer called the universal pardon, okay? And it's a lovely prayer, and <clears throat> it's in our pastoral books. And only last summer, I knew, it was, I knew it was around, but I didn't know where to find it. And uh, this young priest, newly ordained a couple of years ago, and he said to me, Father Michael, he says, you do know about the universal pardon? And he said to me, I said, oh yeah, I know about it. I said, well, where would I get it? He pulls out the book, which is exactly the same as my own. I said, it's not there, is it? And he, well, yeah, there, he says, that's it. I couldn't believe it, but it wasn't on the index. So I've started copying it now and making it available to people. And when I see no one can do it on your priest, so you have to have a priest and have him on side so that uh, he's willing to uh, do this for you. But it's actually universal pardon for their whole lives. So you're actually sending the family member or whoever it is, neighbor, friend, uh, you're sending them straight to heaven. So, and even if they die, you can still say the prayer. So just be aware of that. It's a prayer called the universal pardon, okay? And it's, something goes something like this. Um, by the power given to me by the Holy Roman Catholic Church, I absolve you now of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a fantastic prayer. And like a lot of the young priests, I'm not sure whether they know about it. But anyway, I keep giving up. No, you can't do it. And don't be telling the priest, you must do this. Just say, Father, a friend of mine, a priest gave me this. And would you be able, would you be able to say that prayer for, for my first cousin or uncle or aunt or mother or father, whoever is sick. So they don't have to be on the deathbed, but it's a good thing to be aware of. So these are a few things I'd just like to say to you that God would help you to be aware that you have responsibility to help people to die well as to live well. And remember, when you do die, you know, or when they do, when they die, uh, it's a great blessing because then you have a friend in heaven. And that's why I always love to give the sacrament of the sick. I played with the idea of anointing anyone who needed anointing tonight, but I said the numbers are too great and we haven't enough priests. So I said we'll have to leave that. But maybe sometime, maybe next year or the year after, myself and Dan and the team and the committee might get our heads together how we might do it. Because it's a lovely sacrament, you know, and it's fantastic. And it's for the sick. So I have a vertebrae damaged in my neck here and that qualifies me to get anointed. So. So, by the way, I am 65, so I'm entitled to it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I would say to you, you know, if you're seriously ill, if you're going to the hospital for tests, if you're actually, um, you know, uh, what would I say, sick in the hospital, if you're, you're all these kind of things. And something that's very hard to discern if you're suffering from depression. You know, depression is sickness. Get the sacrament, get the sacrament to help to lift that out of there, you know? Because there's nothing will do it better than the Word of God and the sacrament of the sick. So again, you know, I'd be encouraging you to uh, keep your eyes and ears open, see the ways that you can actually uh, help people to come to a deeper uh, understanding of their faith and that then you help them on the journey. One last little thing on, on those lines I'd like to say to you is that um, you know, we talk about healing. Now, 
there's something else that's more important than healing, and that is your relationship with Jesus Christ and his blessed mother. Because, you know, if you grow in his life, all the healing can take place through that. I remember once um, Robert de Grandis was here in Ireland, and I was very anxious to meet him because he was in family healing and spiritual healing and all that, that whole area, inter intergenerational healing. And uh, I said, uh, the only place I could get to was up to my red people's place up in Bally Kelly near Derry. So I rang Marie and I said, Marie, so would you have any room spare? No, Father, but you know what? We have a parlor upstairs and we'll make a bed in that for you. You'll be very welcome. So I went up. And anyway, I was the only priest there. And uh, the father, by the way, Father de Grandis is not well, I believe, at the moment. I think he's sick in the hospital. I think he's maybe suffering from Alzheimer's or something like that. I don't have the details. But just put him in the prayers because he's done an awful lot of good. And I would hate to think that we weren't keeping him in mind when we knew he was sick. Then, um, uh, so we, after the dinner, then we went for a walk up and down Valley Hill, a small place, but we had a nice walk. And anyway, um, a couple of years later, I was in Magigoria, and uh, there was Father de Grandis. Oh, I know him, says I, you know, myself, you know, so I went up. Um, <clears throat> Hello, Father de Grandis, how are you? I said, I'm Father Michael Ross. I said, I met you up in my red peoples up in Derry. Did you? That's very good for the ego. <laughs> it's fantastic, because I was deflated. Because <laughs> after I go for my walk for the day with him, you said, oh, we're friends for life now. So the next time I see him, you know, I, I'll, he'll know me and I'll know him. Did I? Did you? What? <laughs> so, you know, it's good when something like that happens because it keeps you grounded, you know. So, again, uh, you know, they, they give great insights into the whole healing process, as did uh, Father John Hamsch. Uh, they are two great men who have given us great resources for family tree healing and for interior healing and healing of all kinds of things, okay? So I would say to you, like, do, do please, you know, and the journey, the inner journey into Jesus Christ, getting to know Jesus Christ better, doing your Eucharist adoration, uh, that that's actually can facilitate the healing faster and better than any other way. Because I'll tell you why. Father the Grandest discovered that himself, and that's why he started writing books on the Mass and healing, and on Eucharistic adoration and healing. And uh, he said, um, uh, he said uh, he had people waiting for about, uh, I think about, it went to three or four months, maybe six months, but the, the, the waiting period was getting longer. And by the time they got to him, oh yes, he asked them to do one thing, but they would do an hour a day in preparation for their mass for healing. And you know what happened? I think it was 70 or 80% of them were healed through Eucharistic adoration. Isn't that fantastic? You have it in your own parish at home. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> and don't use the excuse, you know, that, um, oh, we can't get exposition of the sacrament, so we can't have it. Go in and sit. Let the door is closed. That's all right. Uh, you might get permission to put a little candle outside the tabernacle door and say, Jesus, I know you're behind that door. I'm here. Did you, do you know what the little flower did? You know, she used to go up and tap on the door. You know, she, she was tiny. So she had to kind of jump up on the altar to polish the, 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 the tabernacle door. And she'd say, Jesus, are you there? Are you there, Jesus? And then she'd spin out her story. You know, it's fantastic. But you see, some of you have that. You, some of you have that. You just chat away to them. That's from the heart. That's what they call prayers of the heart, you know? When you just sit there and you say, well, I, you know, I, I'm really annoyed, you know, that such and such one did this to me. Or, look, this didn't work out the way I was expecting. That's bringing your heart, the things that are filling your heart to Jesus and Blessed Sacrament. And who was the great man that said an hour a day, Good girl yourself, Fulton Sheen is right. Fulton Sheen's a remarkable man, you know. He's a great, great, great man. And, uh, you know, he's... Uh, you know what happened in New York, you know, when, he, when uh, John Paul II... By the way, John Paul II, of course, being canonized uh, in, in April on Mercy Sunday. And uh, when, when he went to New York, uh, he kind of was wondering where Fulton Sheen was because there was no one introduced him to Fulton Sheen, didn't know where he was. So they went looking for him. Where was he? 
with the Eucharistic adoration. Of course, that's where he was. So a friend of his told me about this, and uh, she said to me, um, uh, the Holy Father, you know, embraced him and shook hands with him, delighted to see him. And then I think he said a little phrase, which I can't quite recall. I think it's a phrase from Thomas Aquinas, you know? Uh, and, and it was kind of almost kind of, is that all? After all his work? But then when the, the phrase was researched, it discovered that, you know, it was powerful. It was talking about, you know, the great things that God does, and you've done this for me, meaning for God. So Fulton Sheen was a great, great man. And please, God, like John Paul too, he'll be canonized in the near future. We'll keep praying for him. He's well on the way. And of course, we have a couple of Irish ones too. Who, what Irish ones are we waiting? Frank Duff, here, here. That's my man. <laughs> Who else? Matt Talbot, good, good. Who else? Adele Quinn, who else? Alfie Lamb, yeah. So there's a whole pile of them. And look, what about all the sisters? And poor old Edmund Ignatius Rises, blessed. We have to shift him up to saint. Who? Oh, yeah, Nano Nagel, the founder of Presentation. Mary Aikenhead, uh, another one? God bless us and save us. The mercy one? Catherine McCauley, exactly. We have a whole pile of them. Why are they sitting there? They're parked. Why? Because you're not praying to them. You know? Oh, the, the <laughs> you see, the problem is, we ha you see, the church is looking for that we have a devotion to them. So we should be following them, you know, and going up to them and root them around. They're above unemployed. Do nothing. Twiddling their thumbs. It's desperate when you think about it. So, again, I say to you, you know, try to have a devotion. Pick one of them. You don't have to pick the whole lot of them, like, you know, because it's better, actually, if you're praying to one, because if there's a miracle, then you can attribute it to that one, okay? So, we've, if you want a couple, a bundle of you each here, to one of them, you think, God, that might be kind of nice, last person you think. I go down to Noel Burns uh, once a month for... Um, spiritual training and that for prayer ministry and that, you know, and Noel and his wife are here tonight. We thank them for coming. It's great support to me. And uh, I, I've learned a lot of little things, but one of the things that's kind of burned into my brain was that every grace that comes, comes through prayer. Now, that's fantastic, okay? So I was with some friends of mine last, uh, uh, this day week, and we were celebrating his 70th birthday, and it was all lovely. And that evening, I had met this man who was absolutely delightful. And, uh, and the wife then, her name was Sue. So I finished talking to him. She said, I'll sit in with you for a while, Father. I'd like to have a chat with you, you see? So I started doing me a little bit of preaching. And I said, you know, Sue, I said, no grace has come without prayer, you know? Oh, Father, she says, I've had loads of graces, she says. And I didn't do any extra prayer. So I said, you might not have done it, I said, but somebody's done it, I said. Somebody in your family, a friend, a neighbor, somebody in heaven, somebody in purgatory. Remember, we don't know who prayed for us, but if you're getting graces, there's been prayer put in, because that's the structure God established. Isn't it amazing? One little prayer, how that burnt its brain into my head, you know? So just remember that when you're praying to these Irish men and women, you know, I mean, Matt Powell is a fantastic example, you know? Uh, could hardly read or write, but he struggled, and he went through, through devotion. You know, Matt Talbot was a devotee. That's what the chains were all about. He was taking what Bonford said, literally. So again, I'd say to you, kind of, pray to our own Irish saints. Get them canonized. And we'll have a whole army above at the throne of God, and all the graces we need will come down on top of us like an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So please take me seriously on that. Pick one of them that you kind of like, you know. That, I like that, Pelinor. I like that one there. And, and work with that. And then press, you become a little, a little promoter of that. And I think we'll see great things in Ireland. Now, I just want to save you little prayers because our time is going by and it's very quickly you, you run for, and time runs over on you. So I just want to save you little prayers. By the way, are you going in to visit the stalls? Put up hands now, everyone that's gone to the stalls already. 
Oh, you're very good. Oh, Janie. Because you see, they're the people who help us to make the ends meet. So like, you know, I mean, they, give, they pay for their stalls. There's one or two who have no money. So uh, Don is very charitable, you know? So he, he, he does a little bit for a few of them. I do, exactly. <laughs> we don't want the whole pile coming up next year now and say, well, we have no money this year now. Will you do something for us? We have to pay the bills, you know? <laughs> anyway, seriously though, uh, we do try to help those who do a great work and at the same time might have not have the money to have a stand. So we do our best to help everyone we can. So again, just a little prayer of, for trust. I think myself that part of our blockages for me, for many of you maybe, I think it's a lack of trust and a lack of confidence. Trust that we trust God that he will do it, confidence that he can do it. We know he can do it. He's infinite power. So why wouldn't he do it? Is it the way he doesn't love us? I've already told you he loves you. He's crackers about you. And he's crackers about the way you are now. So again I say to you, for God's sake, don't start being negative about yourself. But open your heart now to the Lord and say, Lord, I want you to come into my life. Because more important than healing is growth in Jesus Christ. Because if you grow in the life of Christ within you, whatever is wrong in there will be healed. It makes sense when you stop to think about it. In other words, it's another way of coming at healing. How do you grow in the life of Christ? You use the sacraments. What sacraments? Baptism. Healing. Uh, the sacrament of sick. The sacrament of confession. These are used regularly to build the life of Christ within us. And as that grows stronger and stronger, the healing will come more powerful. So that means it's, it's another approach to healing. So you have, it, you have everything you need in your own parish church at home. Lord, have mercy my father, you know, he was not a traveler. I'm the opposite now, I'm a traveler. <laughs> so, he, he, you know, we used to try to get him to go to Lourdes with mom and dad. No, no, he used to say. <laughs> That's right, definitely. Excellent. Uh, you see, see, there's, you're all listening down there. This word came up from the crowd, I think. This is what uh, the John Paul II, you know, God, he was marvelous, wasn't he? Uh, but we love Benedict too, don't we? Of course we do. Different men completely. John Paul would have his face right up in your face. I remember once seeing the part, you know, where he was shaking this when he had the walking stick. And I think it was Davish, you know, no, he said, Your Holiness, please, you could hit somebody, you know? Oh, oh yes, okay, okay. So, like, he, he was just so human. He was so good. And I heard since recently that people who are good for reading all the details said he loved his sweet cakes, particularly the ones that came from Craig. Just, what's the name of the little village where he was? Uh, Wadavici, I think. That's right. They had lovely buns. I tasted them once myself. I have a fear sweet tooth. And do you know something where I got great consolation? Frank Duff. Frank Duff had a sweet tooth. And I saw it myself. And I said, God, there's hope for me. You know? Here, I saw him one night up at the Conchilium office, you know, and there he was kind of going around the, the little, do you know the little box of sweets or little things? And, and he was picking out the ones he liked. <laughs> I said, oh, God, that's great. <laughs> you see, it's very important that the holy people show us their humanity. Because otherwise, you see, we'll be without hope. And hope is very important. Very, very important. So this is, this is what um, John Paul said to, um, to um, Fulton Sheen. You have written well, Pope. To now, I mean, you say, you've written well. No, not so great. But it was actually referring to Thomas Aquinas and it was said of him, you've written well. There's, there's only two greats up to this century, up to the 20th century, and the two greats were Augustine, and uh, Thomas Aquinas. They're two outstanding men in, in, in our theologians and philosophers and our great thinkers uh, who, who were outstanding. But now we have two more. Who are the two? John Paul II and Benedict. They're both brilliant minds and mentalities. And, you know, I just say to you kind of that uh, uh, 
um, they, they just will be unpacking their stuff for a long time, you know? So it's true for Don, I think you need to go to Specsavers, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so there you are, you know, I mean, we have, we have these great men among us and alive, and do you notice how quiet Pope Benedict is, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict is, you know? We've one Pope, that's Francis. But I mean, he, but isn't it great they get on so well together? I think they go for a little coffee now and again, and I think they have a little conversation on the phone now and again. So it's, it's fantastic that he's there for, for, for Francis, you know, and the love they have, the love they share. I can imagine the people above in heaven saying, you know, it's great the two lads are getting on great, you know, <laughs> which is fantastic, you know. So again, just don't, don't, don't be anxious about, about uh, you see, th they're building an example of unity for us as well, and that's important, they're witnessing to that. And there's no competition between them, you know, they're absolutely beautiful people and humble, very, very humble. I like that thing that, uh, was it, who, who said about the humility? Was it C Colin Ray? Colin. Yeah, Colin Ray says, you know, those who are humble and those who will, will become humble. <laughs> that sounds like very serious work to me. <laughs> so, you know, I'd say to you kind of just, just to kind of, uh, at the end of this time now, I'm going to pray back along your generations so that God will bless your family in the most powerful way through the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ. And it's the resurrected Jesus Christ that's here. But, of course, you don't separate bits and pieces of Jesus Christ because, first of all, becoming one of us was a suffering, you know? Because, I mean, all of a sudden, um, I was reading a spiritual writer recently who talks about Jesus in the womb. And, you know, a group of us pray together occasionally and... Um, uh, he was talking about the darkness and the loneliness in the womb, our lady's womb. And I was shocked at this. You know, I said, God, I thought that was the one place we'd get, bit, get a bit of light. You know, but in actual fact, of course, he was God, is God, and both God and man. And to have the full man experience, he went into the womb of Mary. And he found it lonely in there. And, you know, he'd invite people. So sometime, you know, when you're sitting in prayer at Jesus in the Eucharist, you could say, Jesus, I want to share that experience of you being lonely in the womb of Mary and that I want to be with you and I want to console you. It's, you see, because becoming human was actually a huge kind of, I suppose, imposition might be the word, you know, on Jesus. Because Jesus was already God before he was born. So then he became fully man then and then he went to heaven. So he continu continues to be fully God and fully man but it was the fully man thing that, that he suffered greatly as a human being because he had all this restriction, which, of course, is God, and there was no restriction. So, you know, I'd say to you that that's a little thing you might do, maybe just share with him in the womb. I'm with you. I want to be with you. I want to console you. I want to let you know I'm concerned about you and to identify with that little aspect of his life. Of course, the other extreme was when he was dying in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, atrocious suffering. You know, the God-man in the garden, the crown of thorns, the damage in the back. I mean, all this came to life for me, you know, at the life of Christ by, what's that, that um, uh, man that made the film, the great film on the passion of Christ? Yes, yes, that's him. So, you know, like, th these are great helps to us so that we can kind of, you know, r realize and they say that that's not even the full picture, and I believe it. So again, you know, that, you know, that at the beginning there was suffering. All through his life there was suffering. And then, you see, um, he'd be talking about something. He said to the apostles, he said, do you not stun? Do you still not understand? I mean, they were after two years with him, or two and a half years, maybe three years, maybe just before he went to his passion and death. And they still didn't understand. So if you don't understand, don't feel too bad. The first bishops didn't understand. The first pope didn't understand. Peter. So, you know, we're not saying, of course, that we should stay there. We must make an effort. And when you make the effort, what does God do? God opens up your mind and brings you to an understanding. Look at poor old Matt Talbot. Matt Talbot couldn't hardly write. And, like, you know, he used to you know, write down stuff in a notebook, and it was very scribbly. And, I mean, it was marvelous. I mean, there's a standout here on Matt Talbot, you know. There's one there right near doorstep. The Legion have one, two or three people there. So, you know, maybe we should have a little organization for all the fellows that were trying to get canonized, and then you pick one from them. But, you know, like, Matt Talbot was wonderful. You know, he inspired me earlier on. 
that you know you have to put on a bit of suffering in that so that you can and that normally the suffering of ordinary life will be enough for us and God will know how much we can take but don't go looking for it it'll come okay that's what Don Bosco said to Dominic Savio Dominic Savio wanted to put stones in his bed as some of the other when, for example John Sullivan there's another man and John Sullivan used to put pebbles in his shoes which of course I think Matt Talbot did as well uh, and uh, you know th these are only for they're kind of for the honors program you know I think we'll, we'll, we'll stay at the kind of the, the general do you know when you say past degree you don't say past degree you say a general degree <laughs> so we, we'll stay with the general program okay because uh, if you're called to that higher level God will make it clear for you so don't be worried about that at all but if you can embrace the things that happen to you of daily life you know, the sufferings or the annoyances or the problems. And Don Bosco helped Dominic Savio to do that because he gave up all that kind of stuff because the Don Bosco said, oh, no, no, we do it differently here. So again, it's just showing you that there are many different ways. And all the different saints, remember, you're not a centuries of Avila. You're not a centuries of Lisieux. You're not Matt Talbot. We're, I'm Michael Ross, and you're, this is Don Devaney behind me. We have to find our own little way, okay? But God will bring us to that little way, and he'll show it, and he'll open the door for us. So I just, uh, look, I was going to get my whole program. There's a lovely little book I bought outside, and I, I was lucky, of course, I was here on Thursday. So I got the first pick of the shops, and I bought some lovely things, some lovely new books I hadn't seen before. So there's one here, Healing Prayers, I Am The Way. And there's a little pat with rough stones, which was a little thing that came to one or two of us recently, that you may have to go through a little bit of roughness, but I'm with you, and you'll do it. So this is one, this little prayer here is about um, <clears throat> a prayer for trust. And this prayer, prayer book, by the way, is I, uh, Prayers of Healing, and it comes from um, the uh, Divine Mercy people out in... Um, here in Ireland, isn't it? Yeah. Val Collins group. Yeah, that's right. Val brought this out. It's a lovely, lovely thing. And only a couple of bob, you know. So have a few of those round because they're good to have. And if you're ever asked to do a little half an hour, so that you'll have no trouble doing it. A prayer of trust. Oh my God, when I look into the future, I'm frightened. But why look into the future? Only the present moment is precious to me as the future may never enter my soul at all. It is no longer in my power to change, correct, or add to the past, for neither sages nor prophets could do that. And so, what the, what the past has embraced, I must entrust to God. Our present moment, you belong to me, whole and entire. I desire to use you as best I can. And although I am weak and small, you grant me the grace of your omnipotent. That's what I was trying to say to you. If you open your heart, use the sacraments regularly, even if you kind of find it a bit difficult to cut a confession, that's a bit of the purification. It, 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 you know, it gives the old ego a bit of a wallop in the head, you know. Talking about a wallop in the head, I got this email recently, and it said to me, um, they were dealing, it was an exorcist, that I think it was in Italy, and he was dealing with getting the devil out of someone. And lo and behold, anyway, they had, there was a kind of a dialogue going on, and so the, the priest asked him, you know, what do you find difficult? I hate the Hail Mary. I hate the Our Father. He says, and he didn't say much about the glory be, but the glory be is the same, because it's all church teaching and that. So every time I say Hail Mary, now, there's another wallop for you now. <laughs> So the rosary is powerful, you know, don't underestimate. Do you remember? Five, six, seven hundred years, it kept us in the faith. Hold on to the rosary beads. The rosary beads is powerful, you know. By the way, <laughs> Timothy Ratcliffe, Father Timothy Ratcliffe, has a lovely piece on the rosary. Well worth Googling. Uh, we have our own researcher here, um, Paul, Paul Wickham, and he keeps us well nourished. He's uh, always poking through the, the back things and that, back, back files. But he got this one anyway, and it's absolutely beautiful. So look in, would, I suppose, if, would it be Google, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, yeah to Google it and, and look up Timothy Ratcliffe, and then look up on the rosary, and you won't regret it. 
Our present, all present moment, you belong to me, whole and entire. I desire to use you as best I can. And although I'm weak and small, you grant me the grace of your omnipotence. And so, trusting in your mercy, I will walk through life like a little child, offering you each day this heart burning with love for your greater glory. The first big sin was pride. And where did it happen? Heaven. Who was it? Lucifer, the most beautiful angel. But of course, it became like a peacock. You know, I'm as I, I suppose the boss man. You know, and God saw this can't work, so He was thrown out. We have pride as well, and we need to be careful. We have ego, which kind of pushing you, pushing you in the wrong direction. Bow your head in obedience to our Holy Father and to the Magisterium Teach of the Church. Because if you don't do that, you're, you're going down a road which has already failed. And that is in the Reformation, the Protestant churches went out on their own. And they have never stopped splintering since then. If you want to build unity, it's very important to have a huge commitment to obedience. Having a commitment to obedience means that you can What's that? What am I doing? Bowing your head. Because like you're just, to me, it's the greatest security we have. By, you know, we can ring up the Archbishop, we can ring up the Chancellor, we can ring up somebody in the, in the Chancery and ask them for help or guidance or whatever, you know. Like, if you go down your own road, that's all gone. You know? And you say, so I'd encourage you to be obedient, to be united. Build unity any and every way you can. Unity in the family, unity in the parish, unity in the various groups. Like we all know, we all know. I mean, I'm living in community as well. We're worse than children sometimes, you know. Worse than children. Some of us backed off me the other day and I, I said, oh, I said, yeah, you know it all. The following day I came up and apologized to me. <laughs> mea culpa, mea culpa, and that's that's the humanity, you see. They all look at us in the hours and look in. And same in every religious community, by the way. They'll all say to me, who told you that was an order? But that doesn't happen with us at all. <laughs> but in reality, we're just like an ordinary family in many ways. And we've all good days and our bad days. So I would say to you, build unity. Immediately he said to me, I said, I'm sorry too. I said, I was under a bit of pressure. I said, and I just overreacted. I said, sorry about that, you know. So apology is a great thing. The Holy Father said that one day, that if we apologize and forgive, that we'll absolutely be very, very blessed by God. Now, we're coming near the end of our time, so I want to spend the last bit of time praying about our family tree, okay? So you can say sitting down, but, but, but in your hearts, you can be praising the Lord Jesus. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, Praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Mary conceived without sin. Saint Joseph. Saint John Bosco. We ask John Bosco to bless those men gathered in Rome. They're from all over the world. We're in over 100 countries. So that they represent us from all of those places. And it takes them a few days to kind of accommodate to each other and different cultures, different, etc., etc. So I ask the Lord to bless them now and bring a great unity, a great joy, and great harmony among them so that they'll be able to discern what God wants for the next six years for the Salesians around the world. So I'll bless them now too. Lord, we now we ask you, Lord, as we pray for our families, for our friends, for all those we carry in our hearts and brain. That's why I'm saying open the heart, make the heart bigger and put more in, you know, like, in my mind at the moment, those who are praying here, you know, they're good people. They're good people, you know. But so we need to put them in our heart and prayer as well, you know. We don't exclude anybody. God is an indiscriminate lover. He loved his enemies who kicks him in the shins, and he loved those who are absolute crackers about him. Okay? We have the capacity to do that because we're made in the likeness of God. So we must love everybody, pray for everybody, and ask God to bless them and bring them to where he wants them to be. That's so important. And that we honor and respect each other. 
So again, we ask now, Lord, as we gathered here this weekend, that we pray for our families, pray for... Oh, by the way, you know, remember this. The Mass is today, all your families were in it, all your intentions were in it, and the same with the Mass tomorrow. We'll be praying for all of you. So you'll have two Masses which will be offered for all of you and for your families and friends, whether they're here or in Brussels or Timbuktu or Africa or it doesn't matter. Space and time is nothing to God. He's outside of those. So, Lord, now we pray for our families in a special way this evening. We ask you to bless our families in the most powerful way. As we ask you now to bless our families and our bloodlines first, as we go back along the bloodlines, we ask the Lord to bless our family bloodlines. And we pray back along the bloodlines from the first, the second, the third, the fourth generation. That's what it says in Scripture, by the way. I used to go back further, and I said, no, there's no need to. Scripture didn't ask for that. It said four generations. So, Lord, we ask you now to bless our people back along the four generations and give them that great healing and fullness of God's life and the fullness of the life of Christ so they will come into the full presence of God in heaven. So, Lord, we also pray now about our, um, first of all, we pray back along our mother's, our father's line first, uh, first, the second, the third, the fourth generation, and then we pray back along our mother's bloodline, uh, blood from the first, the second, the third, the fourth generation. Remember that scripture. Heavenly Father, we ask you now to bless our families, but also I'd like to add in one or two more groups, which would be um, the little ones, who have been aborted. We're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for the moms and dads. Often the dads go out of the picture if it's outside the marriage, and they leave the woman on their own. So we're praying for the moms and the dads that they all act respectfully and responsibly. So we're praying for the little holy ones who were aborted. We're praying for uh, the moms and dads, and we're praying for all the families interacting. We're also praying for all the pro-life workers, that God will bless them and give them strength and courage to remain in the field, witnessing to life, the life of God within us and among us. We ask you, Lord, to bless all those, Lord, that we carry in our heart in prayer. Uh, we ask you, Lord, to bless the little ones who have died and are, um, you know, it could be caught death, it could be they didn't come to full term. These are natural things, but they're a part of the holy innocence as well. I call these groupings holy innocence, because that's what they are. So we pray for all of them tonight now, Lord. So by the power of the Spirit and through the sword of the Spirit, we ask you now, Lord, to deliver these little ones and the souls in purgatory. You know, I'll tell you in a second, I'll finish this prayer first. We ask you, Lord, to bring all these little holy souls now into the full presence of God tonight. So through the power of the Spirit and through the sword of the Spirit, that they come into the precious blood of Jesus and then come into the full presence of God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And we pray for those who are alive in our families who have sicknesses and sufferings and difficulties and problems. And, you know, nothing is impossible to God. If you went home with just those words in your mind and a trust and confidence in God, you will see things happen in your life. So please, we saw Don and myself and all the committee saw miracles over the last month. Miracles. Wonderful, wonderful miracles. And in actual fact, God was giving us a commentary through prayer people, and it all turned out to be correct. So, you know, God is all powerful. That's why I say His word is powerful. So please use His word. Pick up His word and, and read it and reflect on it and allow it to take possession in your heart, in your life. Just want to tell you about um, this. Uh, uh, he's blessed now. He's a Jesuit in Brazil who came from Germany. Um, uh, John Baptist Ruiz, Ru 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 R-U-I-S. He's blessed John Baptist Ruiz. And he was a very holy man in Brazil. He, 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 he our, our Lady and, and, and Jesus, you know, appeared to him and started telling him about things which he heard about but maybe didn't sink in deep enough. And some of the things was that when the priest is washing his hands, Our Lady is there with a the towel to dry his hands. Another one, uh, Our Lady has the power to bring all the holy souls to a Mass. So I said to her, bring them all to all my masses. I want them in my mass. I want, I want the holy souls there. I have great love for the holy souls. And she can bring them in in front here. If we say the people are where you are, then the, the holy souls come in in the middle. And then behind the priest are the angels and saints in heaven. 
And then, of course, on the right-hand side of the priest is uh, the saint who is saint of the day. And on the left-hand side is, uh, you know, a, a, another saint. So there's, it, like, there's a whole spiritual army around us when we're celebrating the Eucharist. And there's nothing. This is all in, in, in keeping with church teaching. And all this wonderful stuff which he, is, which he has taught us. And I'm sure when he's canonized in the years ahead that we'll have more of his teachings. Because not a lot of it, I'm lucky, I have one of our missionaries at home in, in, in Maynooth who's been many, many years, 34 years in, in, in Brazil. So he's able to translate for us some of the stuff and that. And it was he put me onto this man. And uh, because once he started to speak about Holy Souls, he already had me captured then, you see. But again, if you're talking to kids, you know, and say, but Father, where are they all going to fit? You know, and you say, ah, oh, Janie Mac, I said, these, these fellows are very tidy. They can fit a lot of them in a small place, you know, because <laughs> they're outside space and time. So again, I'd ask you to be aware of this good man, John Baptist Ruiz, R-U-I-S, and, uh, you know, he has uh, some lovely things written about the, uh, the Mass, primarily the Mass, but then about the Holy Souls, that she has, that Our Lady has the power to bring all the Holy Souls. So when you're at your own Mass, invite the Holy Souls in, and ask God to, um, to, to be with you and allow them to share more fully on, uh, in the Mass. Now we're going to finish, and I want to say a prayer of consecration for all of you. It's a prayer of protection, a prayer of consecration, and I do it with the Eucharist. And then we'll, um, uh, we'll finish off with that, and the music minister will come back in. All praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Mary, conceived without sin. Saint Joseph. Saint Patrick. Saint Bridget. All the angels and saints in heaven pray for us and protect us. I have a great love for the little flower. I admire trees of Avon, of course, but I have great love for the little flower. So we'll ask the two, the two traces to pray and intercede for us as well this evening. Jesus, you're always present to us. Help us to be always present to you. If you remember, say it with me. Jesus, you're always faithful to us. Help us to be always faithful to you. Jesus, you're always loving to us. Help us to be always loving to you. How do we love Jesus? We love Jesus by loving our neighbor. Not easy at times, but that's the challenge. That's the journey. And if you fail, don't go around hitting yourself with a mallet over the head, you know. Just say, oh, I fail in that one now, Lord. Help me to be better in the future. That's not a gift. And he's, oh, let me go down and give the Lord a hug. The Lord be with you all. God, our Heavenly Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Trinity, one God, we praise and worship you. We thank you now to bless your people here and all those who had to go home in buses and that. They're all being blessed through this prayer now. We ask, bless them, Lord. Protect them. I ask you, Lord, to bless the church and bless the world at this time. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, Pope Emeritus Benedict, all members of the mystical body of Christ, all of us, we're all members of the mystical body of Christ. This is the church in the world today. We ask you, Lord, to bless also now uh, those uh, who are enemies, touch their hearts, transform their lives, and bring them to yourself. We ask you, Lord, to bless also all the millions, there are millions of people seeking the truth, that Our Lady, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will bring them to the fullness of life in Christ. That's our work. That's our job. To bring us, all of us, to full life in Jesus Christ. We're his brothers and sisters. And she wants us to be like him. And she doesn't do it on her own. She does it with the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, surround them all in the presence of Jesus. Consecrate them in the Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And seal them now, Lord, in your most precious blood. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit descend upon you upon your families and friends and remain with you always. Amen. So
my prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, come to our aid. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We reflect on our day and look at our conscience and see what the Lord is saying to us as a result of this beautiful, blessed, and anointed day here. Lord, have mercy and hear me. When I call, when when I call, call answer me, O God of justice, from anguish you release me, have mercy and hear me. O men, how long will your hearts be closed? Will you love what is futile and seek what is false? It is the Lord who grants favours to those whom he loves. The Lord hears me whenever I call him. Ponder on your bed and be still. Make justice your sacrifice and trust in the Lord. What can bring us happiness, many say. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put into my heart a greater joy than they have from abundance of corn and new wine. I will lie down in peace and sleep comes at once. For you alone, Lord, make me well in safety. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy and hear me. Bless the Lord through the night. O oh, come, bless the Lord, all you who serve the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Lift, Lift up your hands, hands to the holy place, and bless the Lord through the night. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made both heaven and earth. Glory, Glory be to the, the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day, day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed us, Lord God of truth. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Save us, Lord, while we are awake. Protect us while we sleep, that we may keep watch with Christ and rest with him in peace. At last, At last, all powerful master, you give, give leave to your servant to go in peace according to your promise. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all nations, the light to enlighten the Gentiles and give glory to Israel, your people. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Save us, Lord, while we are awake. Protect us while we sleep, that we may keep watch with Christ and rest with him in peace. Come to visit us, Lord, this night, so that by your strength we may rise at daybreak to rejoice in the resurrection of Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Ex Pes Nostra Salve, A Te
Father Michael is coming back up to bless religious objects, so just hang on a minute. So Eileen's telling me there's copies of the healing service that we had available over on the stand beyond, and the copies of the rest of the day's CDs are there also. So 